Okay. Hello, everybody. I hope uh, you are well, everybody. And so now we begin the second uh, lesson of uh, uh, Professor Sheldon Solomon, uh, who is uh, one of the most important uh, uh, scholars uh, in the area of uh, psychothanatology, specifically. He is uh, a professor of social psychology and uh, one of the founder of terror management theory. In uh, this second minute uh, meeting, uh, he presented a particular uh, part of uh, uh, his uh, lessons and talk, and uh, uh, the title is uh, The State of the Art of a Terror Management Theory. Thank you so much, uh, Sheldon, for uh, participating in this uh, uh, cycle of uh, seminars on terror management theory. Uh, you have uh, 40 minutes for your talk, then uh, we will have lots of answers and questions to present to you, and we hope that the time is enough. Thank you so much. Uh, very good. Um, can I share the screen, Erica, to uh, get some pictures up again? Yeah, it's saying I'm disabled on this end. Ah, uh, there we go. All right, I'm assuming that, uh, uh, hello everybody, uh, wherever you are. Uh, good to see some of you again from yesterday. And uh, those of you that are joining us for the first time today, uh, welcome and uh, I'm assuming you can hear me and that you're seeing the slides and so on. And uh, I'm almost, uh, I think, ready to go. Okay, so here we go. And uh, thanks again for uh, your patience. Uh, so uh, very quickly, let's just do a, a two minute uh, overview of uh, what we did yesterday to just uh, remind us of where we're at. Uh, terror management theories based on Ernest Becker's ideas that uh, the uniquely human awareness of death gives rise to potentially debilitating existential terror that we manage by embracing culturally constructed beliefs that give us a sense that uh, life has meaning and that we have value. And, and we talked about three basic um, research paradigms, the idea that self-esteem buffers anxiety, the idea that when we remind people uh, of their mortality, uh, that uh, they will engage in cultural worldview defense as well as self-esteem striving. Uh, and then we talked about the death thought accessibility paradigm, the idea that uh, when either your cultural beliefs or your self-esteem is threatened, uh, then uh, death thoughts should come more readily to mind. And I'm just bouncing through these slides because uh, we saw them uh, yesterday. And, and this brings up where we ended up last time around, and that's so what? Um, there's a substantial body of evidence that I would submit um, is fairly compelling in support uh, of Becker's claims. Uh, and well, uh, so what? Uh, and in the world that we work in, uh, this is often a question that's uh, framed in terms of conceptual power. Uh, what is it that we can understand um, uh, through reference to these ideas that would be difficult or impossible otherwise? Uh, and so my goal for this afternoon, or well, this afternoon for you all, the morning for me, is to just uh, do a little bit of an overview of some of the different areas of research that these ideas have been applied to, um, and that will bring us up to some of the most recent work. So we're going to be doing applications in the state of the art, uh, as it were, kind of at the same time. All right, our original interest in these ideas uh, was to... Um, understand why it is that people have such a hard time getting along 
uh, with other folks who do not share their beliefs uh, about reality? Why is it uh, that history is one ongoing succession of genocidal atrocities uh, juxtaposed uh, with the brutal subjugation of domestic inferiors? And, and Becker's answers are disarmingly simple. He says, look, if your beliefs and my beliefs about reality diminish death anxiety, then the mere existence of somebody who's different is threatening. Because if I uh, accept the legitimacy of somebody else's beliefs, I, under, I undermine the confidence with which I subscribe to my own. I, moreover, um, uh, Becker points out that cultural beliefs are, are very potent, but they are still symbols and they're never potent enough to completely eradicate death anxiety. Therefore, any residual uh, anxieties are in psychodynamic terms repressed and then they're projected onto other individuals uh, who we declare the all-encompassing repositories of evil. Either way, when we bump into people who are different or when we declare somebody uh, to be different, uh, we then proceed to denigrate them, to dehumanize them, and, and indeed, if need be, to destroy them. Right? In accord with that view, when we remind, uh, for example, Christians of their mortality, uh, they uh, like fellow Christians more uh, and they hate Jewish people. Germans reminded of their mortality sit closer to Germans and further away from people uh, who appear to be immigrants. Uh, when we remind people of their mortality and give them an opportunity to actually harm somebody uh, who has different beliefs, they will do that. Uh, Iranians reminded of their mortality uh, are more supportive of suicide bombing and more willing to become a suicide bomber. Uh, Americans reminded of their mortality uh, are more supportive uh, of using chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons uh, against countries uh, who pose no direct threat to us. And, and in one particularly chilling study by, uh, by Jeff Schimmel and, and Joe Hayes, um, at the University of Alberta. Uh, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but they had Christian participants read uh, either a neutral article or an article that was about uh, Muslims uh, wanting to take over um, the, the Holy Land. Uh, and, and, and then half of the participants, and these were Christian participants, uh, they also read an additional uh, paragraph uh, that in half of the cases uh, said that a plane load of devout Muslims uh, passed away when their plane crashed on the way uh, to a religious festival and that nobody survived. And then they had a measure of death thought accessibility. And what they found is that not surprisingly, Christians who read an article about Muslims wanting to take over the Holy Land, that increased death thought accessibility. However, in the condition where people also read that a plane load of Muslims had died, uh, that uh, eliminated completely uh, the elevated death thought accessibility. In other words, the, what they found uh, was that the death of the evil others uh, reduced, in this case, the Christian participants' own mortal terror. If we had a little bit more time, I would talk about Robert J. Lifton's fine book, Destroying the World to Save It, uh, where he points out that along the lines of Ernest Becker in the book Escape from Evil, uh, that a good deal of the evil in the world is caused by people who righteously proclaim that they're ridding the world of evil. And that indeed, uh, we may be the first form of life to be directly responsible for our own extinction uh, if we're unable to come to terms uh, with the fact that uh, underlying a, a good deal of ongoing animosity and strife uh, is a bullion base of existential anxieties. Right, another line of inquiry that is uh, the basically started and still uh, led by Jamie Goldenberg, who's now a professor at the University of South Florida, it is based on the idea 
uh, that concerns about mortality uh, also make us particularly queasy about the fact that we're embodied animals. I know that some of the old timers may have watched the film, The Elephant Man, uh, where the main character depicted on the slide says, I am not an animal. It's a big part of the film and everybody, myself included, is like, yeah, uh, I'm with you. But of course he's wrong. We are animals, uh, like it or not. Uh, and what we know from this line of work is that death anxiety fosters alienation from nature uh, and contempt for the environment. When people are reminded of their mortality, uh, they take ardent issue with the claim that humans are animals. If we compare humans to animals, that increases death thought accessibility. There's another fine study by some Dutch researchers uh, showing that uh, when death is on our mind, that we're uncomfortable in natural settings. And there's also some fine work by Ken Sheldon and Tim Kasser showing that when death is on our mind, that we are more likely to greedily exploit the natural environment in ways uh, that deplete uh, non-renewable resources. All right, well, continuing this line of work um, are also experiments that uh, were designed to test um, this little phrase, sex and death are twins. I should have put quotes around them because this is a, a phrase from Ernest Becker um, in The Denial of Death, uh, where he pointed out that rather counterintuitively, that if these ideas are correct, uh, then there is, at least from time to time, a degree of psychological discomfort that is aroused uh, for some people in certain circumstances vis-a-vis -vis sexual activity, right, despite the fact that nominally and certainly biologically, uh, sex is generally something that we consider extraordinarily pleasant and of, is, of course, necessary uh, to perpetuate the species. Uh, and yet, uh, what do we know? Well, when we remind people of their mortality, uh, it decreases their, um, the, their, the appeal of the physical aspects of sex. And you can see a little questionnaire on the right uh, where we've got some items with asterisks so you can get a sense of the ones that uh, are physical uh, as opposed to more spiritual or slash romantic uh, quality. So reminding people of their mortality reduces the appeal of the physical aspects of sex. And then uh, just asking people to uh, read the items on the right, uh, the ones that are asterisk, well, that increases death thought accessibility, particularly amongst folks that are high in neuroticism. And the idea here, according to Becker, is that sex reminds us that we're animals and animals die. Uh, sex, he also argues, uh, has a de-individuating function uh, in the sense that when we're engaged in sexual activity, we are just essentially biological entities uh, keeping uh, this circle of being going, uh, but uh, it doesn't require any particular uh, individual, any partner, reproductively speaking, uh, will suffice. And then uh, what we know is that uh, when uh, we first prime people with the romantic aspects of sex, uh, and so if we just ask people to respond to the 10 items on the right that do not have the asterisks, well, if we do that first uh, and then we have them, um, the, the think about the physical aspects of sex, uh, then death thought accessibility uh, is no longer increased. And, and what this suggests, according to Ernest Becker, is the way uh, that uh, we make sex palatable 
is to um, is to render it a cultural artifact by embedding it uh, in spirituality. All right, so uh, let's keep going uh, and uh, let's talk about the role of existential anxieties uh, in helping us understand humankind's seemingly insatiable desire uh, for uh, money and stuff. Uh, and uh, this work is based uh, primarily on a, a, just a magnificent chapter in Becker's book, Escape from Evil, called Money, uh, the New Immortality uh, Ideology. Uh, and the point that Becker makes is that for most of the last century or so, uh, economists saw um, uh, money and, and economic behavior uh, as just a completely rational exchange of goods and services. Uh, and what Becker said, though, is that, that that's simply not the case. Uh, and this is, an actual, this is actually an idea that goes back to John Locke, the Scottish philosopher who in the second treatise on government, he said, you know what? Anything that's of real value uh, that, that exists in nature uh, is of finite duration. And there's an upper limit to how much you want of it. You know, so uh, I like apples. If you eat apples, you can stay alive. All right, but there comes a point uh, where you've had enough apples and you're like, hey, I don't want any more apples. Uh, pizza, uh, beer, sex, anything uh, that is of nature. Uh, well, there, there's a point uh, where enough is as good as a feast, uh, as Mary Poppins put it. And yet, uh, there's two things where there's never enough, never enough money and never enough stuff. And uh, Becker's point is uh, whenever there's insatiable desires, we can assume uh, that death anxiety is lurking beneath them. Uh, and uh, I like uh, Tennessee Williams in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, who said the human animal is a beast that dies. And if he's got money, he buys and buys and buys. And I think the reason he buys everything he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he's got the crazy hope that one of his purchases will be life everlasting. Uh, and so sure enough, uh, a bunch of experiments have been done uh, showing that uh, when we're reminded of our mortality, uh, we say that we would need more money in order to feel wealthy. When we're reminded of our mortality, uh, we have a greater desire to buy stuff, not just any stuff. We want high end luxury stuff that confers status. Um, we, when we're reminded of death, uh, want to be, we are more apt to say we want to be famous. Uh, when we're reminded of death, we're willing to pay more money to have a star named after us. Uh, in the uh, in the galaxy, uh, when we're more reminded of uh, when we're when death is on our mind, and we're asked just to draw pictures of money, uh, we draw bigger coins and bigger bills, uh, as if just uh, as if money looms larger. Uh, when death is on our minds. And, and uh, for those of you that are familiar uh, with uh, United States money, you can see on the top right on the back uh, of an American $1 bill is in God we trust, showing that uh, money is a, a blatantly religious symbol. More importantly, to the left, the little pyramid with the top of it uh, illuminated and floating in the air. Um, that's evidently an ancient uh, Egyptian symbol of immortality. All right, one more study done by Tom Pazinski and some Polish colleagues uh, that I thought was quite remarkable. Uh, they did a study in Poland where uh, they just gave some participants a stack of money and, and asked them to count it. They gave other people a stack of money-sized pieces of paper and asked them to count that. And uh, then basically nobody gets to keep the money or the paper. You just have it in your hands for a minute. And then they measured death anxiety. 
And quite surprisingly, I think just counting money uh, was sufficient to reduce death anxiety, uh, showing, I think, very poignantly and profoundly uh, how much money uh, has always been psychodynamically speaking, a very loaded symbol that uh, definitely confers intimations of immortality, both symbolic as well as literal. All right, another area of inquiry that I wanna mention in passing with the caveat that we will return uh, to clinical considerations uh, when I get to see you next week. And this is the role uh, of existential anxieties uh, in different forms of psychological disorders. Uh, and here we take our cue from Erwin or Irvin Yalom in the fine book, Existential Psychotherapy, written in 1980, uh, with lots of direct connections to Becker. Uh, and here's Yalom saying, all individuals are confronted with death anxiety. Most develop adaptive coping modes, modes that consist of denial-based strategies such as suppression, repression, displacement, belief in personal omnipotence, acceptance of socially sanctioned religious beliefs that detoxify death, or personal efforts to overcome death through a wide variety of strategies that aim at achieving symbolic immortality. Either because of extraordinary stress or because of an inadequacy of available defensive strategies, or if Yalom was writing today, I hope he would add, or in addition to neuroanatomical aberrations and biochemical imbalances, the individual who enters the realm called patienthood has found insufficient the universal modes of dealing with death fear and has been driven to extreme modes of defense. These defensive maneuvers, often clumsy modes of dealing with terror, constitute the presenting clinical picture. All right, we've done quite a few studies with clinical as well as subclinical populations uh, showing uh, that death anxiety underlies. This is not to suggest that it causes, uh, although in some case it might, but it most assuredly at the very least amplifies uh, pre-existing um, uh, pre-existing um, uh, disorders. So for example, we found that reminding spider phobics uh, of death increased their fear of spiders. It did not have a commensurate effect uh, on the non-phobic. Uh, when we reminded obsessive compulsive uh, participants uh, of their mortality and then put them in a situation where we could surreptitiously observe them washing their hands, uh, we found that death reminders increased the amount of soap and water and, and towels that participants used. Uh, it, when we reminded socially anxious people of their mortality and gave them an opportunity to hide in isolation and avoid contact with their fellow humans, uh, it doubled the amount of time uh, that they spent by themselves. Uh, and we also know uh, that death reminders increase uh, retrospective reports of peritraumatic psychological dissociation. Uh, and this is a known precursor uh, of PTSD and, and led to the development by Tom Pazinski and some of his collaborators uh, of the anxiety buffer disruption theory uh, where terror management is used as a way uh, of thinking about PTSD. And we're gonna come back to this uh, when I get to see you next time around. All right, w w for the remaining moments that I have, I wanna spend a, a little bit more time um, on uh, what is uh, uh, pretty much uh, what I've been spending most of my time on lately uh, and what I think is um, of radical importance in the world in which we currently reside, uh, particularly uh, in my country. And um, this is the idea uh, that existential anxieties have a lot to do uh, with the popular appeal 
uh, of populist slash fascist uh, slash totalitarian. Uh, I'm going to glob those terms together. Uh, and um, this is based on Max Weber, the, the great German sociologist, uh, uh, who he was the one who coined the term charismatic leader uh, to describe how in certain times of historical upheaval uh, that we, all of us, tend to embrace certain kinds of leaders that seem to be, and here's the way Weber defined it, a certain quality of an individual personality by virtue of which he is set apart from ordinary men and treated as endowed with supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. All right, in other words, the charismatic leader is a seemingly larger than life individual who believes or is believed uh, to be divinely ordained uh, to rid the world of evil. And, and what Ernest Becker adds to that um, in both the birth and death of meaning and in the denial of death is that it is death anxiety. Uh, that is the ultimate motivational impetus uh, to, that underlies um, this particular phenomenon. All right, we got interested in this line of work, um, well, a, a long time ago. I actually got interested in it in 1980 when I first bumped into the denial of death and I read Becker's chapter uh, about of the role of death anxiety in Hitler's ascension to power. He writes about it in Escape from Evil also. And, and this was in 1980 when Ronald Reagan uh, was uh, elected president of the United States. Old timers, I used to call Reagan the happy Hitler. I thought he definitely had a touch uh, of these kinds of characteristics. Anyway, we did a, a study uh, it, around, uh, I don't know, 20 years later, um, we started to do work in this area. Actually, we started to do this research in the aftermath of the events of September 11th, 2001. All right, more on this later, but we did a study uh, where we just showed that death reminders increase support for charismatic leaders. The first study was a very simple vignette study. Participants read uh, three vignettes that varied in terms of leadership style, charismatic, I'm the best, fuck the rest, task oriented, we, I get stuff done, relationship oriented, we have to do this together. Everybody read the statements, they were in random order, and then they just said who they were going to vote for. All right, look what happens in the control condition. The charismatic leader gets four votes out of 100. If you remind them of death first, however, almost eight times as many votes. Death anxiety is definitely um, uh, oxygen for the charismatic. All right, then we noticed that President George W. Bush went from the least popular to the most popular president in American history um, in a three-week period in the aftermath of September 11th. He said that he believed that God had chosen him uh, to lead the country at this time and that uh, um, he would help us rid the world of evil. All right, sure enough, uh, we did a bunch of studies back in those days, 2003, and we found that um, a, a mortality salience induction increased American support uh, for President Bush. I, and then we found that uh, this was uh, at the expense of uh, the John Kerry, the Democratic candidate. So you can see on the left that our participants liked John Kerry, who's in red, a whole lot more uh, than they did George Bush, um, who's in green. But if you look on the right, uh, after a mortality salience induction, and this was a completely crossover interaction, uh, that their uh, affection for Kerry declined and, and uh, their affection for Bush increased. And we reproduced that finding uh, a number of times, All right? And then five weeks before uh, the 2004 election, uh, we stopped registered voters at Rutgers University, reminded them of death or not, and then said, who are you going to vote for? Right. In the control condition, 
uh, our participants reported that they intended to vote for John Kerry by a more than four to one margin. However, if they were reminded of their mortality first, uh, now they said they were four times more likely to vote for uh, George Bush than in the control condition and more than twice as likely uh, to vote for Bush than Kerry. All right, so uh, let's bring this up to the present moment. Uh, and um, uh, let's note that in 2015, uh, when Donald Trump came down uh, the escalator and everybody laughed, I wasn't laughing. I said, this fucking guy is a monster and, and he's gonna get elected. All right now, uh, the notion of monstrous clown is, is not mine. That's David McCullough, an American historian. Uh, who, when the, Donald Trump declared his candidacy for president, along with hundreds of other historians, uh, said this is a really uh, bad idea. Moreover, some of you may be aware that lots of psychiatrists uh, and other kinds of mental health experts uh, were also concerned. Uh, and so basically the historians were like, look, uh, a vulgar, sadistic, vindictive, pathologically narcissistic sociopath who was also a, a racist, misogynistic, uh, homophobic, functionally illiterate, uh, pussy grabbing, twittering Mussolini. Bad idea uh, to have someone like this in charge of anything. The point, though, of the psychiatrists, and I believe this to be uh, of incredible importance, is that more than anything, it is the so-called dark triad uh, of malignant narcissism, sociopathy, uh, and a lack of empathy, maybe touch in a few, or toss in rather, uh, a few paranoid and grandiose delusions. But the argument is that uh, it is very dangerous to put somebody in a position of power who is fundamentally and congenitally incapable uh, of ever admitting that they're wrong or that they have lost. All right, more on this later if it's not already evident why this is so important. Uh, don't, um, don't, don't leave the world uh, if you're interested in these matters uh, without uh, looking at a book by Eric Hoffer called The True Believer, written in 1951. Uh, Hoffer, after World War II, it's like, okay, we got to figure this out. How'd we get Hitler? How'd we get uh, Mussolini? These folks were elected uh, somewhat. Uh, and uh, even though this is written years, decades before Becker, I, I want you to notice how much the ideas coincide. He says, look, the primary impetus for these kind of movements uh, are a mass of frustrated citizens in a state of economic or psychological insecurity who need something to live for. And, and because of that, uh, they, 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 they swear loyalty uh, to a leader who confidently espouses a cause because this infuses their lives with a sense of worth and meaning. There's that value and meaning. And that in turn, uh, by virtue of identification, uh, gives the individual something bigger than themselves to be part of. There's this idea uh, of symbolic immortality. Right? And then Hoffer goes on and he says, look, these kind of leaders, they're not, they don't have to be that smart. They actually rarely are. They're certainly not noble or original. Well, what do you need? Uh, well, the primary qualifications, and here I'm quoting Hoffer, seem to be audacity and a joy in defiance, an iron will, a fanatical conviction that he is in possession of the one and only truth, faith in his destiny and luck, a capacity for passionate hatred, contempt for the present, a cunning estimate of human nature, nature a delight in symbols, spectacles, and ceremonials, the arrogant gesture, the complete disregard of the opinion of others, the single-handed defiance of the world, and some deliberate misrepresentation of facts. 
it seems like this could have been written by Trump's biographer. And there's only one word that's wrong. And it's some in the last line, because 80 percent of the auditory stimuli that are emitted from Trump's oral cavities are um, not true. All right. And then uh, you need on top of that an external enemy. What the, what the fascists and, and all kinds of totalitarian leaders do, uh, and I think it's Jason Stanley, he's a Yale political scientist who has written about this. Uh, he just says that, uh, the, or this is my way of putting it, but basically uh, what populist leaders are, they're, they're alchemists of hate. Uh, they take the fears of their followers and they transmute them uh, into rage and indignation. Uh, and they direct their followers to take that rage uh, and to direct it at a tangible scapegoat. Again, who you declare the all encompassing uh, repositories of evil, the eradication of which would make life on um, earth as it's purported to be in heaven. I finally, uh, all of these movements, and here's Hoffer, strive to impose or interpose a fact-proof screen between the faithful and the realities of the world. They do this by claiming that the ultimate and absolute truth is already embodied in their doctrine and that there is no truth nor certitude outside of it. It is the true believer's ability to shut his eyes and stop his ears to facts, which is the source of his unequaled fortitude and constancy. He cannot be frightened by danger, nor disheartened by obstacles, nor baffled by contradictions, because he denies their existence. All right, so here's Trump in 2018. Don't stick with us. Don't believe the crap you see, the fake news. What you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's happening. And here's Trump a week ago, the fraudulent presidential election of 2020 will be from this day forth known as the big lie. Pure Hitler, whatever you're doing, accuse the other people of doing. And uh, you can see a recent picture uh, of, um, I find this just very uh, disheartening to look at, but that's that's me. All right, so um, what are the facts? Well, the facts are uh, the death anxiety uh, got Bush reelected and it got Trump elected, uh, I would submit. Uh, even before Trump uh, was the nominee, uh, we did an experiment showing uh, that death reminders increase support for him uh, and people's uh, willingness to vote for him. All right, then in uh, right before the last election, uh, uh, we found that American participants liked Hillary Clinton uh, more than Donald Trump in a control condition, uh, but that their affection for Trump increased uh, when uh, in the in response to a death reminder, All right? And so, uh, so what? Uh, you know, so death reminders make people more supportive of Trump, right? But they don't hand out uh, death reminders at Trump rallies, and and I don't know that uh, that they have subliminal death primes on Trump websites, right? But turns out you don't need to do that. Uh, you just need to demonize others uh, because it has the same effect. And so in 2016, Trump was all about, we got to kill the terrorists, we got to keep the Muslims out, and, and we've got to keep the Negrotinous horde from storming the southern border. Um, real quickly, uh, what we have done is to show that asking Americans to think about terrorism or asking Americans to think about a mosque being built in their neighborhood, or asking Americans to think about immigrants moving into their neighborhood, that increases death thought accessibility the same amount uh, as being asked to think about yourself dying. I right, think about that. That's understandable for terrorism, perhaps, uh, but so much has the discourse been poisoned in the United States 
uh, that just thinking about a mosque or an immigrant it is enough to increase death thought accessibility as much as being reminded of death. And this in turn um, increases support uh, for Trump. All right, so uh, basically what we knew before 2020 is that uh, existential anxieties increase support uh, for Trump. Uh, in 2020, same thing, different repositories of evil. Uh, now it was the Democrats, uh, the socialists, Antifa, they were going to take away your guns. Uh, people of color uh, got the anti-Asian uh, reaction to the COVID virus. Um, but it had the same effect. And so this is from a study that we did uh, just prior uh, to the last presidential election. Um, for the moment, let's just look on the left for just white participants uh, who you can see in the pain control condition. Uh, they like Joe Biden in blue a whole lot more uh, than Donald Trump in red. Uh, crossover interaction, when death was on their mind, uh, they now like Trump uh, a whole lot more uh, than Biden. This was also true for non-white participants, although we didn't get a crossover interaction. And uh, I suspect that's why this election uh, was a lot closer uh, than many people believed it to be. I, I'm gonna stop talking in about a moment, uh, but I, I do wanna point out that I, I believe this to be one of the most ominous and important phenomenon uh, that's happening right now, uh, at least in the United States, but that this has implications uh, for uh, democracy and political and economic stability um, all over the world. Um, if you have some time at some point, I recommend this very excellent book by Volker Ulrich, uh, which describes Hitler's uh, early days. And I would urge you to take a peek at this and to recognize uh, how much uh, what Hitler did in Germany is happening uh, now in the United States. Hannah Arendt, who wrote a book about uh, totalitarianism, uh, wrote about how uh, the, when, a, when a fascist comes to power, it, it is often um, they win an election uh, somewhat legitimately, often with a minority of the population. And, and once they've won the election, they use democracy to end democracy by undermining the judiciary, uh, by attacking the press, uh, by uh, restricting voting, all of the things uh, that uh, we're seeing uh, happening in, in the world around us right now. And, and the point that I would make and that, um, that would be funny if it wasn't actually happening is that I, I see all of this as an extraordinarily malignant manifestation uh, of the psychopathology of a single deranged individual. So, so here, here you have Orange Hitler, uh, as I refer to him, uh, tragically incapable of ever admitting that he lost. And, and so here we have the big lie, uh, almost to the point where it can destroy Earth. Because besides being responsible for a considerable degree of unrest in our country, Donald Trump is singularly responsible for a large proportion uh, of the disinformation and misinformation uh, that has surrounded the COVID pandemic. All right, so there's a great book, uh, I can't remember who wrote it, but it's about the COVID pandemic. Uh, and it's by uh, Richard, it could be Richard Horton. He's the editor of the British journal, The Lancet. And uh, he just writes uh, about how much of the difficulties in the world uh, that have resulted from the pandemic are, are the direct result of former President Trump's mendacity. All right, so uh, uh, enough uh, for today, just to sum things up and, and to uh, see where we are and then head to where we're headed. My hope today, 
uh, was to convince you that Ernest Becker was quite right when he said that intimations of mortality affect all aspects uh, of human affairs. Uh, and um, everything that we have done to date uh, suggests that he is quite correct um, in this regard. Right, as I also said, um, uh, what I hope to do next week is to use these ideas and we'll extend them uh, into the clinical domain, into the domain uh, of palliative care, uh, palliative care in medicine uh, and in life, because I think this is a good moment to extend the range of people that we need to attend to in that regard. Okay, so thank you very much. Time for some questions you, and you. answers. Thank you, thank you for you because uh, your uh, lesson uh, teach us uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, to pay attention, especially uh, to information, uh, the media information. And uh, there are uh, already two uh, answer, uh, uh, very interesting that underline uh, the uh, risk that uh, the use of uh, death anxiety may change uh, the political uh, life. So it is uh, really significant that uh, we understand that uh, all you have uh, explained uh, in these two meetings. Now we have also Hodor Kibi. Hi, Hodor. We are very happy to see you. Uh, <laughs> Hod, where are you? Uh, uh, in Tel Aviv? Yes, uh, I'm in Tel Aviv. Uh, thank you, Professor Testoni and my colleagues here, and for you, Professor Solomon, for this uh, remarkable uh, speech. Uh, I find it very, very relevant to actually our current situation. I didn't think about it uh, before you just spoke, and uh, now everything comes together very, uh, strongly and clearly. And I want to uh, share with you my thought and I wonder what you think about it. Um, I am, a, 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 together with Professor Testoni and other colleagues who are here, we, I'm, I'm a psychodramatist. I'm the head of the doctoral program at the University of Haifa in Israel. Uh, I live in Tel Aviv. And uh, you know, psychodrama is a, is a group method treatment. And Moreno, Jacob Levy Moreno, the father of uh, psychodrama, he said that the true therapeutic procedure uh, should treat the entire of mankind and not only the individual. This is his sentence in, the, in his uh, very well-known book, Who, Sh Who Shall Survive? And um, I am thinking now about the uh, implications of everything you said very clearly, Professor Solomon, about the uh, individual who is, uh, uh, suffers from psychopathology, like uh, Hitler and other uh, um, uh, figures that you've mentioned. And unfortunately, uh, I feel now that, uh, and I'm connecting it to what I said about uh, uh, Moreno and psychodrama, that it is uh, um, also moving to the broader society and not only for this uh, one person. So in my experience now, people who are following those kind of leaders are also, uh, some of them, not all of them, of course, but some of them are also, uh, I, I, I've, I've been calling it, it's like a psychotic state of being because you don't know already what is right and what is wrong. And uh, I wonder what do you think about, um, uh, I know that you would probably speak about it in the next meetings, but uh, given the fact that uh, at least I'm doing a lot of uh, um, uh, natural studies and uh, intervention studies, um, I'm thinking of, and we also have the concept of sociodrama, not only psychodrama, we also have sociodrama, which is the kind of a treatment of the broader society. And um, given the, the uh, use of fear to, uh, in, absolutely right, to uh, put uh, people into a state of anxiety and the rhetorics of uh, inducing fears, 
and uh, not only this, but uh, uh, instigating wars and instigating conflicts to make this death anxiety more concrete, tangible, and uh, actually much, very much indeed uh, real. I just came from a talk that I gave an hour ago in the UK and in the middle of the talk, I had to leave this room, it's my office, and move to the security room because there was a siren, an attack of missiles uh, from Gaza to Tel Aviv. So I wonder, what do you think um, about the spread of the fear to the mass, to the mass people? And um, I'm really looking forward to hear about how we can uh, try to treat people or to re-educate people or to even just reflect them that they are captured in this fear that is, uh, uh, in my uh, opinion, is absolutely relevant to uh, a massive psychopathology of the masses and not only the individual, because it's, it's, it's literally influences our life. So, yes, and we feel it and, it, and I, has, and I have to, to say that it's also very post-traumatic because, so yes, I'm, I'm grateful for this talk, for your talk and uh, making sense a little bit of our experience of what we are experiencing with the government, but yeah, so wow. thank you. Well, thank you, Hod. That was a, a magnificent um, articulation of, I think, what's happening. Um, and of course, you in Israel today are, are most vividly um, immersed in it. But I, I, I do think that uh, people more than ever now are uh, uh, immersed in these um, essentially, yeah, big psychodramas playing out at the level of society. I, I think that's a, a wonderful way to think about it. And they're uh, partly because of the pandemic and partly because of uh, explicit efforts to maintain high levels of fear and anger on the part of, uh, of, of political actors. I, and partly also because of, uh, you know, just the reality of 21st century technology. Uh, Marshall McLuhan back in the last millennium, you know, this idea that the medium is the message. The, I, I, the way that I've been talking about it with my students here in New York is that, um, yeah, uh, for a lot of people, it's just no longer clear uh, what's real or not. Um, you know, it's basically, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, here I am, I'm walking around. I don't know what's real till I'm told on Facebook what's happening. Uh, and uh, there comes a point where it, for, for those of us who are not in cities where the bombs are actually falling, um, when I see those images, it's no different than in my video game when I see things exploding. And I think we're in this kind of almost science fiction like state where we are, many of us, completely immersed in, um, yeah, a giant psychological drama masquerading as reality. And there was a recent piece, I can't remember who wrote it in the Atlantic, talking about how in the United States, at least, politics has become religion. So these psychodramas uh, are um, their life and death uh, existential. Um, yeah, they're just really ultimately based on these larger than life existential claims. N nicely done. I uh, thank you so much. I ask uh, if Michael, uh, Christopher, uh, Soshi uh, have uh, questions. Okay, Michael. Hi, Michael. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, um, I'm from Austria, so 
Uh, and I reminded, uh, we remind as Hot said, uh, Kiel Moreno, the founder of Psychodrama, he died today, 47 oh. years ago. So it's uh, just a coincidence. Oh. And another thing in Austria is uh, uh, we, we are mostly Roman Catholic here. So it's, it's a holiday and it's uh, the Christ uh, going to heaven. Uh, it's, it's, I think in English, it's attention of, of Christ. Uh, so I don't know what you make out of this <laughs> uh, story. And, and uh, as, as Hot uh, uh, told us uh, what's happening now in Tel Aviv and Israel, uh, um, we, we had a half year ago a terror attack in Vienna. It was a young, young, bo young man, uh, migrant family, and he wanted to be an Islamic State fighter. And he went to jail and uh, had to pass an anti-extremism uh, course and, and passed it and uh, set free. And he, he bought a, a gun, a machine gun, and killed several people in front of a synagogue. And uh, at the same synagogue, uh, 40 years ago, a Palestinian attacked. Uh, and uh, we still try to do terror management because we, we don't understand how this could happen. Uh, the police knew that he bought uh, in, in, in neighbor countries the guns and, and the, the bullets for it, uh, but it didn't intervene and it's, it's, it's curious. So uh, of course it's not comparable what HOT is going through now in, in Israel, but uh, uh, that was my association to terror management. So, Shoshi. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sheldon, for these um, inspiring understandings about our motivation as human beings. And I really want to discuss a little bit um, the role of arts in terms of uh, death and anxiety. And it seems like um, much more adapting coping, coping uh, uh, method uh, in terms of death and anxiety. And I, I would like to, maybe you can present some of your understanding or research results re regarding the role of arts. Wow. Um, I will, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit. Um, and then before I see you all next, I'll go back and remember what we did. Um, <laughs> Because, um, yeah, in our view, art has a, a very special role in human affairs. Um, and um, we adopt basically Otto Rank, um, who Becker is very much influenced by. And... Um, who saw art as uh, really the highest expression of our humanity and at our best, the most potent way to manage existential anxieties in a um, a psychologically uplifting and pro-social fashion. So we, we know, for example, um, that uh, looking at things that are perceived as beautiful can have palliative effects. We know that death reminders um, increase a desire to engage in creative pursuits. And we also know that what's best in the aftermath of creativity is an explicit effort to share our artistic works with those around us. And so art positioned in a social context 
Um, I like how a, a guy named Henry Miller, a dead uh, fiction writer of the last century, uh, he said, art is a stepping stone to reality. And I always love that uh, as um, in that every great idea uh, originated in the imagination of an artist. And, um, and so um, I'm blubbering at this point, but I, I, I see, um, yeah, art as central to uh, human well-being. And I don't know that we have yet, um, we're, we're just starting, I think, in terms of uh, research to think about uh, showing how these different kinds of pursuits uh, have a tremendous palliative value. So, um, you know, we started with terror management theory uh, saying, okay, uh, to manage existential anxieties, we need uh, uh, the confidence in our culturally constructed beliefs and we need self esteem. And so, for a lot of years, that's what we worked on and yet we do need to believe that life has meaning and that we have value but there's lots of ways um, to make that happen and i i think artistic pursuits um will eventually um be determined to be amongst the best thank you okay. Thank you. Thank you also for this uh, significant uh, answer. Christophe, if you have an answer or uh, we have uh, some answers from uh, people who follow us. Oh, we cannot uh, listen to you, Christophe. It's better. It's better. Can you hear now, me? Now, yes. A little bit. Now it is better. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Christoph. It is impossible to listen to you. Uh, no. Also. And uh, now, yes. Ah, now we have. Try again. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's a technical thing. So thank you very much for very interesting speech. Uh, and my question is related to uh, two things: to COVID pandemic and to psychotherapy. So. What is the most important um, advice or or findings thinking about the TMT theory and pandemic uh, psychological effects and uh, what therapists can learn from TMT research, especially in the current pandemic situation? So how, how we can explain social behaviors like in my country, for example, the attitude towards masks or accept or don't accept masks and, and so the illusion among young people that we are not so in danger thinking about COVID and so on. Yes, th those are uh, you know, tremendously important questions, Christoph. I, we have written uh, about uh, the pandemic and I, I feel silly a little bit when um, people have called me from around the world and asked, if uh, the pandemic might remind people of death. And to which I reply that, you know, they could stop a child on any street corner. They didn't need to call me. Some things uh, you don't need to be all that expert in. I'm being a little silly, but um, the, after September 11th, 2001, we wrote a book and we said that was like a giant death reminder. And the pandemic's an even more giant death reminder. And sure enough, everything that we have found in our studies when we remind people of death, it has been true uh, with the pandemic. And so we remind people of death and they're more racist and they do more hate crimes. Well, then the pandemic comes and in America, we're more racist and there's more hate crimes. We remind people that they're gonna die and they like President Trump more. 
Well, there's been epidemiological studies in the US that show that support for Trump is correlated uh, with death rates of COVID, showing that death on the mind is a good thing uh, for fascists. And so the, the pandemic ha has uh, been a, a pervasive death reminder. Similarly, uh, we know from our studies that all forms of psychological disorders are amplified. Well, this too ha has been found to be the case. With regard to what to do about it, that's <laughs> really uh, an important question. Now, some of this I hope we can come back to uh, and uh, uh, by the way, I, I know nothing about therapy. So my wife, Maureen, who's a therapist, she always gets angry at me because she says, look, um, you have spent the last 40 years pretending to understand people by hiding in your office and never actually seeing them, um, which <laughs> is true. Uh, and uh, which raises the question of, well, how can these ideas be practically applied? And the answer is, I don't know. I'm going to be in a jar of formaldehyde in um, hopefully in Israel in front of Bar Ilan University. Uh, and it's the young folks and you all that are in the programs where you're actually helping people that I hope are going to be able to turn these ideas in to a therapeutically effective, empirically accessible outcomes. Um, where right now, um, I'm not sure if this is the case in Europe, but in the United States, our healthcare system is, has been almost completely destroyed by the pandemic. About 25% of the doctors and nurses in the US have PTSD-ish symptoms. And about 25% of the doctors and nurses say they're going to quit, as well as about half of our teachers. That's how traumatized uh, people are. Now, I'm working with some very talented researchers, and what they're wanting to do uh, is to design existentially oriented short term therapy, including art. Uh, and to compare that to the more traditional approaches in our country, it's CBT. Uh, and, and, and so our view is with all respect to CBT, it was not designed to address difficulties of an existential nature. You know, so I, I have problems with CBT anyway, but we could talk about that another day. But my point is like CBT, uh, will be like rainwater cascading off a duck's ass in a hurricane. It, it'll have no effect uh, on the traumatized. And so to back to your fine point, Christoph, I think that um, this suggests to me uh, that in therapeutic settings uh, that addressing broader existential concerns uh, will be more pressing and that's why when I've been speaking lately in palliative care settings, I've always felt that palliative care is like the gold standard for how you treat another human being. And my view is everybody on earth uh, is deserving of and in need of palliative care. And uh, let's figure out uh, how to do that writ large. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So we can create, uh, I think, a collaboration for uh, the solution uh, of uh, these uh, problems and the collaboration for terror management theory and uh, uh, therapy, social therapy, who hold uh, and all of us love. I think that uh, there is uh, time for uh, some question from uh, our followers, uh, because uh, uh, they are really interesting, and uh, we have also uh, some questions from uh, our students. So, uh, who can read them? Silvia? 
Okay, so I'll start with some questions in the chat. So one is asking, Michele Gerardini is asking, is it possible that these mechanisms related to MS and the effect on voters' decisions have been scientifically used in co campaign communications, media, and especially social, social media to manipulate the votes? Yes, I think that that's a, a very fine point. And I know this to be true. It's a long story and, and feel free to contact me. But we, we have pretty good evidence that the people who advised President George W. Bush were very much aware of our studies and they didn't, re they, they knew, they, they knew uh, uh, Steve Bannon, who was one of President Trump's advisors. Uh, he, he knew Hitler's work quite well because he said it's fear and anger that get people to the polls. So I, I do think there is a sense in which, unfortunately, the best politicians, as well as uh, the best, and I'm using best in quotes here because uh, this is unfortunate. Yeah, but the, the best politicians and the best um, business leaders, the ones who I don't admire, they, they have a, a, an incredible knack for engaging people uh, at the level of the amygdala. Yeah. Yeah, there are also other uh, two uh, uh, questions absolutely significant. Uh, can you read uh, them, uh, Silvia? Yes, so another question by Giulia uh, Salvalayo is, we talked about items like money, and we said that they play an important role in increasing or decreasing death anxiety. Thinking about the digital world and social networks in particular, which play an enormous role in our lives, do you think that technology could increase or decrease death anxiety? Awesome question. Um, I'm going to try and have it both ways. Uh, both. I, and, and I say this partly empirically. Um, we did a, a little study here um, a year ago where we asked students to give us their phones for one day. And then we gave them a, a little old phone so that they can tell us how they were feeling like every four hours. And so anyway, in my country, um, and probably where you are also, because I remember being in Israel in the early days of cell phones and everyone had them, even the people digging holes in the dirt in the street were talking on their phones. But um, within hours uh, of um, giving their phones to us, you would have thought these people were in the middle of an earthquake on top of a hurricane after a terrorist attack. Um, their levels of anxiety and depression were extraordinarily high and their self-esteem uh, was uh, really low. So this suggests that uh, these items and the activities that um, we engage in with them uh, do have a narcotic effect. On, on the other hand, I, I've also, I think it's also equally the case and I hope for every one of us in the midst of the pandemic that access to the same technology has been able to allow us to do things like we are today that might be tremendously beneficial. So I hope it doesn't seem uh, too much of a cop-out to say that I see it both ways and that it depends on circumstances um, I, I wouldn't want to throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. Having said that, social media can be the end of earth uh, because of the capacity to ratchet up uh, emotions and to spread them more prolifically than 
even a, a virus. Oh, interesting, absolutely. We have a lot of answers uh, again. Uh, can you read the, the last one in uh, the end there, Silvia? And uh, also the, the, uh, of Ugo Pasquali in the chat. In, uh, Yes, so he, uh, Ugo Pasquale is saying that given the fact that MS leads to the explosion um, of totalitarian beliefs and regimes, and given the fact that we have been constantly reminded of death in the past 15 months, how do you see the, the following years in terms of political elections in the world? And then he proceeds and he says, do you think this would be related to the degree of restrictions put in place in each country? the more restricted, the more prone to vote in favor of totalitarian regimes. Um, and then he thanks a lot, uh, Professor Sh uh, Sheldon Solomon for his uh, great contribution. Uh, well, no, thank you so much. These are fine questions. I, I do believe that, um, that we are going to see um, death, anxiety, drenched um, elections uh, everywhere. And I do think that what I see in the United States right now, it, it is eerie to me because I had just this summer read Hannah Arendt's book on the totalitarians and how they acquire power. And it's almost step by step what we're seeing. And um, yes, there's always efforts to um, just ensure that there's no uncertainties vis-a-vis -vis electoral outcomes. So I, I see um, lots, I see a lot of countries going to be moving in the direction of the hungries of the world where, you know, there are, quote, elections, but no one seriously doubts the outcome. It, more be, it may be an unfortunately ominous moment. Uh, for democracy. I'd like to be wrong, by the way, uh, except that uh, where I'm sitting now, this is my office at Skidmore, and I'm no longer in the psychology department because we ran out of space. So I got put in the history department, and, and um, historians are annoying because you can't just make shit up like I do all the time. So when I walk up and down uh, the halls, uh, you know, just like saying stuff, they'll hand me books to read. And that's how I got the Hannah Arendt book. Uh, because when I was calling Trump a fascist a year ago, um, what the historians are like, well, you called Ronald Reagan a fascist, and then you called George W. Bush a fascist. And I was like, yeah, I, I called Reagan the happy Hitler, and I called George W. Bush the hapless Hitler. But Trump is the heinous Hitler. And anyway, then one of the historians is like, well, I disagree with you about Bush and Reagan, but you're right about Trump. And it's not only in the US that the historians here in European history say there's a lot of, um, a lot of things right now that are eerily parallel to conditions that uh, were in place a year ago. Remember, we, none of us were here, but we went from the last pandemic to the roaring 20s, to the depression, uh, to World War II. And that will be bad enough, um, except that on top of all of that, we're going to get need in the groin in the next decade in the form of weather change that makes the pandemic seem like a mild case of indigestion. So I, I see tumultuous times ahead. And that doesn't mean that I'm gonna be right, but to the extent that I am, I think some of these existential notions will become um, no less relevant for understanding what's happening. And then ideally, back to you all next week when we cogitate about these matters, what are the implications of these ideas for the work that you do and for the work that all of us ought to be doing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, really clear. Sheldon, can uh, we present another question uh, of students? Uh, I'll be here till 2025, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know, Georgiana or Nicola or uh, Gianmarco, do you have um, 
Good evening. I have a question for you from Alice Kulkazi. In your opinion, does the COVID-19 pandemic offers an opportunity to talk about that in a different way? Or do you reckon that that has only been discussed in medical and biological terms? So possibly accentuating the already existing theater of death. Yes. Awesome observation that I want to, uh, I, I want to, uh, just say that's an important point, and I think that that's worthy of a chunk of our time um, as we move to clinical matters coming up. Because uh, on the yeah, uh, on the one hand, um, this is a pervasive reminder of death, the the COVID, but also remember that that in our studies when we remind people of death, and then they turn into uh, humans behaving in ways uh, that are, are not all that um, it, worthy of admiration. Uh, you know, we remind people of death and they become racist, they vote for populists and so on. But those are subtle death reminders, you know, like standing in front of a funeral parlor, or, or the word death being flashed really fast, Next week, I want to make a case uh, that uh, that that a a more protracted um, a, a more protracted consideration of uh, of death, uh, including one's own death, is utterly necessary uh, in order to overcome uh, some of the adverse effects of these phenomenon, and I, I think that. The pandemic has done that uh, for some people. Uh, and uh, so again, I'm trying to have it all ways. I, somebody, I did some interview for somebody last week and they're like, well, what's the effect of COVID as we kind of re-enter life? A and I was like, well, some people, um, it will take them less than 10 minutes to start to behave as if nothing had ever happened. Um, in, in Kierkegaard's terms, uh, they manage death anxiety by being tranquilized with the, by the trivial. Other people though, uh, I think uh, uh, whether this was voluntary or not, I think that the COVID um, was a, a fine opportunity for some people to metaphorically and literally step back and to think quite explicitly, what does this mean uh, for me? Uh, and, and, and I think they will come back into the world uh, with a rather radical reconception uh, of what it is that uh, is meaningful and important to them. And so in this case, I would submit that the COVID experience has been a, a very positive one. Right. Similarly, in, in our country, uh, uh, you are uh, perhaps all familiar with the murder uh, of George Floyd, the gentleman in Minneapolis, uh, uh, where the, the white policeman uh, suffocates him by kneeling on his neck for eight minutes. Well, the good news, again, any death that couldn't be more terrible, and and but that had an effect uh, in America. It was a tipping point uh, of sorts, but I don't think it would have done anything in the absence of the pandemic. I, I think they would have been, oh, another black dude got killed because the week after that, another black guy got shot in Atlanta when he fell asleep at a, a restaurant. But my point is, is that, and I don't, I'm not trying to sound glib, but if it weren't for the pandemic, George Floyd, maybe people would have been upset for a day and then it would have been on to the next murder. And so one good thing that the pandemic might have done is to give people the space to step back a bit and that this could be a good thing. Because again, I don't mean to sound cynical, but nothing good in my country has ever happened, as Martin Luther King pointed out, except under duress. 
uh, people don't voluntarily give up power. People don't uh, spontaneously metamorphosize uh, from racists into decent humans. And, and so it was the Depression and World War II that in America uh, produced everything that I think is good about America, uh, roads, social security, uh, the idea that you have a right to eat. And, and, and now the any good thing that's happening in my country is only because uh, of the pandemic. If we weren't in the pandemic, uh, Trump would still be president uh, and um, the, the world uh, would look considerably different. So uh, my long-winded answer is yes, I, I do think the pandemic um, it is arousing concerns about mortality to varying degrees in ways that for some of us who have the good fortune of having slept in a bed last night and have had breakfast today, uh, we can uh, uh, be in a position, as Nietzsche put it, you know, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Unfortunately, it's going to kill too many people first. Oh, thank you, Sheldon. Shoshi, do you have uh, the last question? I saw your hand. Uh... No, it was just a mistake, but uh, I have many uh, many questions and you answered a lot. And thank you very much, Sheldon, for this inspiring talk, really. It's, uh, I'm going uh, I'm, I'm going to stay with the thoughts and, uh, and the ideas that were raised today. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And so we will see you next uh, week. Uh, thank you. Thank you to all of you. Bye. Yeah, bye now.